Look at that. Oh my god! What the? What are you doing? What are you? Get out of here! GTFO! Hey everybody, how's it going? So today we're gonna get to work on an A1708 that's not powering on, and I have my doubts that this one is going to be as easy as the other one that we just did, where there was a screw that was plugged into a connector. So the first thing that we always do in troubleshooting these devices that are not turning on is we unplug the battery and check out how much power the board is drawing by itself. How, checking the amount of power that the board is drawing is very similar to checking somebody's heart rate on screen or like getting their EKG. It gives you a general, like it, it's not going to tell you everything, but it's going to give you a general idea of what is going on. Now, if you're going to take somebody's uh, heart rate to see what's going on, you don't want to take their heart rate while they're on a treadmill. You don't want to do that test while you, you're probably going to tell what their pulse is or what their blood pressure is while they're sitting and resting. And I want to do the same thing here. I don't want to see how much power the board is drawing while it's charging the battery because charging the battery is going to take a different amount of amperage depending on how far charged the battery is. So that's kind of a moving target. I want to see how much power the board is taking by itself without anything, any, you know, excess stuff that's going to pull a lot of power connected to it. So what I did over here is I just unplugged the battery and we're going to use a USB-C amp meter that you can get on store.rossmangroup.com and we're going to plug it in and see what we get. And as you can see, one charge port actually doesn't respond at all. Nothing in that charge port. And now we're going to see what we get in the other charge port. So let's just plug it into that charge port and we will see what we get. Nothing in either charge port. Okay, that's, that's particularly strange. I'm going to unplug the charger from my desk and plug it back in. I just got scared because I touched a magnet and it made a loud noise. That was the sissiest thing I've done in a long time. Uh, okay, so no, no response there. So I'm going to take the board out. I'm going to see maybe if there's some dirt in that charge port of some sort and see why it is that I'm not even getting a response. What I, I'm going to do is I'm just going to make sure that my charger didn't blow up or something by plugging it into this Samsung S10e phone that I have just to see if it gives me a reading here. And as you can see, when I plug it into my Samsung phone, it jumps up to 9 volts and 0.5 amps, so it's trying to fast charge, which it's not actually doing because it's only charging at 300 milliamps. But you, you get the idea. Not only is this charger working, but it's also able to differentiate whether or not to charge at 5 volts or 9 volts. So it is not an issue with my charger nor with my amp meter. So we're going to take the board out of the case and see what it looks like on the other side of the case. And we're going to go from there. Again, I just wanted to say uh, two announcements similar to the last video. A, thank you very much to Jesse Cruz for contributing to Repair.Wiki. Look at all the stuff that you have over here for iPhone troubleshooting. Just for the iPhone 7, he posted all of this. This is insanely detailed troubleshooting here at repair.wiki and I hope to be able to get more of it and also thank you to Catherine for fixing the formatting in this little document that I created this is the document that I have at the um, at the description of all of my board repair videos I have this little document and it's really kind of a kindergarten ish introduction to electronics repair. So for instance, here's a buck converter. And what I did is I put pictures on the schematic that show you a visual representation of how you take eight volts and turn it into one volt. I give you a visual representation of how a DC to DC boost circuit works. And it really just kind of goes over a lot of basics. Like for instance, how is PP bus G3 hot created? It does all this. And she went through my document and she fixed a lot of the formatting. And I just wanted to say thank you very much for the effort and time that she put in to do that. And thank you very much for the effort and time put in by Jesse Cruz to contribute to Repair.Wiki. If you're interested in contributing to Repair.Wiki, just do me one favor. I got one favor to ask. Don't ask me if you can contribute. Just contribute. Just make an article. Do you cover alarm clocks? Don't ask. Just post it. Do you, what about a moto phone? Don't, don't ask. Just post it. Don't ask. Just post it. Don't ask. Just post it. And if it's for a, if you have a degree of information that, that is uh, this 
this detailed for a device that is this in demand and uh, you know it's not you know if it's something that's going to take you like seven or eight or 50 hours to post but you think it's really valuable because it's for a device that is very very popular uh, contact me and we could work something out regarding compensation this is a nonprofit, so there is a limit to what I what I'm able to provide but um, I, I, I am going to try to get as I, I really do want to motivate people who are best in their craft to contribute as much to this as humanly possible you can see that we've been contributing as much macbook information as we can for uh, for macbooks over here based on what we do here at the store you can see there's a, just a lot of stuff incredibly detailed and my goal is to make what we do here more accessible to all people so we are going to continue on here i'm done with my shilling for the wiki and with that shilling being done we are going to get on to the board repair. We'd likely be a, yeah, I, I'd probably be better off shilling Audible or Raycons or something, but I like my little wiki. I want to show my wiki. I have a dream. I have a dream of the people that get into doing this and also people that want to fix their stuff having an easier time and a better time going through it than I did. When I started, I have a dream of not being in an industry where people think that sharing information means the demise and death of their ability to provide for their families, where people are actually open to sharing what it is that makes a repair doable so that maybe it can be more accessible to more people. And I want the next generation of technicians that enter this business to enter a business that, that actually shares information that we're, we're best practices and ideas on how to do things are out there in the open rather than hidden behind closed doors because if it's the only way that you're going to make a dollar is if all, of, if all these solutions and ideas are hidden. I want to grow the pie. I want to get the next generation of people that get into this business to think about growing the pie rather than just grabbing the largest amount of the pie they can for themselves. There's so many items out there that need to be fixed, and there's so many consumers that have no idea that independent repair is an option. That we just keep pushing forward and getting more people to realize that independent repair is an option. There is more than enough business for everybody. What, what we lack are people that know how to do all of these types of advanced jobs. It takes too long. It takes far too much time to learn how to do a lot of these things to be able to, to for any one shop, to be able to have every single solution. And some of the solutions in that wiki are solutions that it may have taken someone 30 or 40 or 80 or 100 hours to finally figure out. And once you finally figure it out, once you finally figure it out, it's a 15-minute repair. But it's a 15-minute repair once you've gone through the process of banging your head against the wall for 40 hours. And the more that we can share, what I'm hoping, is that you won't have to go through a 40-hour nightmare just to figure out if something is fixable which means you'll be able to say yes to more repairs that you would have otherwise said no to, which means that you'll be able to satisfy more customers. And the more satisfied customers there are out there, the more people that see repair in a favorable light, the more people that say, see repair in a favorable light, the higher likelihood of right to repair moving forward. So it's all part of the big picture to get more people involved, more people to be able to have more knowledge and confidence to be able to do what they didn't know how to do before. Okay, so we're just going to take a look at this charge port over here and see if anything looks funny about it because this charge port is not responding to my charger at all. And as you can see, when we look at it, there's nothing really looking funny there. This, it, it doesn't look corroded or nasty in any way now, does it? So I'm just going to give it a little bit of a clean with this alcohol and an ESD safe Apple certified Q-tip that I got from the store. This is an Apple certified Q-tip right here. Look at that. Okay. Oh my God. What the? What are you doing? What are you? Get out of here. GTFO. What? This, what is this, a freaking Paul Daniels stream? This shit is only supposed to happen in Australia. Look, he's hiding under the fucking heatsink bolt. I see you, you mofo. Get out of here. GTFO. 
Bro. He's, he's hiding. Look at him. He's making me flip the board back and forth. Get the fuck off of my desk. Okay, let's inspect the specimen. This should give us an idea of why it is that we were stuck and uh, at the, this machine not activating my USB-C charger or amp meter. So let's see if we can get an idea. So I didn't crush him, I just mildly tapped him to get him on this piece of tape over here so that we could inspect him. Maybe it'll give us some hints as to what's going on. So we're gonna study the specimen. So this appears to be a part of the problem with this computer. Yes. Look at him, he's playing dead. Come on, shorted DC in cap. No, you know it's going to be a shorted... It's going to be a... a ch the charge port itself is shorted or has a hole in it. I barely tapped you. You're playing dead. There's no way you're actually dead. Come on. Are you actually... You can't possibly be dead. I barely tapped you. Oh, well. Anyway. So, let's just take a look around the device for a quick moment. We're going to take him and move him out of the way. GTFO. So we're going to figure out what the F happened to this particular MacBook. Let's just take a look around and see what we see. I'm also going to take the little rubber piece that goes around the heatsink and I'm going to put it with the machine so it doesn't get lost. Paul loves those little rubbers. Okay, so we're going to take a little tour around the machine. First thing we're going to do is... Go, we're going to adjust the white balance on the camera. I probably do have to clean the lenses and everything inside this microscope at some point because there's a p little smudge on the screen and it's driving me nuts, but I don't know at what point in the microscope camera setup it is. And that's, this thing is like seven years old, so it really does need to get cleaned. Okay. So I see a little green over there, but uh, never mind. It's just like a piece of glitter. It's an 8200875. Now, we have corrosion right by one of the CPU MOSFETs, and as you may remember from yesterday's stream, that's not very good. This is most likely going to indicate that 12 volts went to the CPU, and if you're unaware of how that kills boards, you might want to check the video that I posted to the channel just about two days ago to un get a greater understanding of how, the, how a buck converter works, how a buck converter fails, and how that will kill one of these boards, whereas it wouldn't kill one of the older Core 2 Duo machines. We're going to continue navigating around the board, and we're just looking for anything that looks out of place. Anything that looks out of place or suspicious in any way, and see what it is that we find. So I don't see anything here that looks really out of place. And you got a little bit of funky looking dust over there, but no big deal. And really, I'm looking for something that's going to be related to the fact that the charger doesn't turn on. Now, that was not initially part of the problem that was included in the ticket. The ticket says that the S5 rails were pulsing, and I find it hard to believe that the S5 rails are doing anything before we can even get a charger to work. So I, now, now that the bug is off the board, I'm just kind of curious if that allows the charger to work where it did not work before, and if that doesn't work, the next thing we're going to do is we are going to look and see if there's a short on the DCN. Okay, so now the charger is working. So what we did to fix the charging problem is we removed the bug from the board. So the bug being on the board uh, screwed everything up. The next thing we need to do before we get started testing everything else, again, I, I really don't want to be messing with this while there is corrosion in this area. So we are going to immediately replace this. I don't want to risk that this is dead. Um, eh, by this, I mean this over here. I forgot to change cameras. My apologies for that. And once we replace that, we will get on to doing the other work that needs to be done on this machine but I, I really just don't feel comfortable leaving that on the board knowing that it was corroded knowing that there could be a chance that this is going to cause my CPU to get spikes of 12 volts so we are going to remove that before we work on everything else we are going to be focusing on the root cause of the issue and what they discussed but before we do that I just want to address this because this is a more serious problem and it will if it's not addressed right now. So we are going to find 
the chip on the schematic in the board view, which you can see on screen in Paul Daniels' software called Flex Board View. Paul Daniels' software is an amazing piece of software that always does what it's supposed to. And we are also going to replace, as you remember from yesterday, we're not just going to replace this chip, we're also going to replace the buck converter controller chip that it is being controlled by because when these get liquid damage, one tends to kill the other and it kind of creates this cascading failure where, you know, chip A dies. When chip A dies, it kills chip B. So you replace chip A, but then chip B is dead and chip B being dead winds up killing the new chip A that you put on the board and it just winds up being a whole hell of misery. So... First thing we're going to do before we do anything else on here is address the immediate problem. Now, I see corrosion by a MOSFET in a buck converter that's going to a CPU. That's the first thing that we are going to get off of the board. I can't trust it. Sometimes things that are mildly corroded can be touched up, but this is just not something I want to trust because this is going to be providing power to the most expensive chip on the board. That is also one of the most vulnerable chips on the board. All righty. Now, uh, one of my trademarks is using a little bit too much solder on the center pad, I'm aware. And you will see how we deal with that momentarily. It is not a big deal, and it will look like factory when we're done. I'm just going to take my chip off of a donor board. One thing I often do is I keep my donor board outside the microscope, and I keep the board I'm placing the chip on in the microscope. The reason I do this is I don't need accuracy to rip something off of a donor board, but I do need accuracy to place something back. Now, if you're removing a chip, if a chip this big, admittedly, you may not have to worry about as much, but when you're removing a chip that's really small, you really don't want to be moving the board back and forth with your right hand and trying to hold the chip in your tweezers with your left, because eventually, what's going to happen is the chip is going to wind up coming off of the board. So what I'm going to do here, and you're going to see this is going to look like factory, even though my hand looks like this, is the surface tension is going to pull the chip where it wants to go. It's going to be exactly where it wants to go but it's gonna to be too high on the board. So once it's soldered on there, what I do, see how it floats itself into place? I'm gonna tap on the top of it, push it down. And then I pull my hot air away, and it doesn't matter how much my hand is shaking because I'm pushing down. So when I, if I'm pushing down, I'm pushing the chip onto the board. When I'm pushing the chip onto the board, I don't need to worry about shaking because it, it, it doesn't matter if I'm moving left to the right. It doesn't matter if I'm moving left to right. As long as my hand is pushing down, that is going to save me there. So I, as you can see, the chip is perfectly in place. And when I l show you around the board, it's going to look completely even to the chips that were placed on the board at the, at the factory. Even though my hand is, uh, I'm, I'm probably one of the least suited people to be doing this type of micro soldering work on planet Earth. But you'll, you'll notice that it actually does not look different than the other ones after minor adjusting. That is the magic of surface tension. I hear so many people say, my hand is unsteady, so I can't do this type of work. I'd love to do what you do, but my hand isn't steady like yours. And it's like, bullshit, whose videos are you watching if you think my hands are steady? And you'll see that little cap that I moved under there. Also, you'll see, notice this thing on the, on the cap. You'll see that there is what looks like a Hershey's Kiss. You see this over here where it looks like the top of a Hershey's Kiss on the cap? It's sticking out. That means that soldering was done with not enough flux available. So when you put flux, you don't want to leave a joint like that. That's very, very bad. So what I do is I use a little bit of hot air and a little bit of flux, and that's just going to naturally get flown in a place where it, where it naturally wants to be. And you'll see that happen when I use the hot air and just slowly preheat the board a little bit. And with that flux there, just watch and wait and see what happens to the capacitor once I tap it. It is going to be absolutely beautiful. And it's, look at that. Give it a little tap in five, four, 
three, two, one. Oh, I didn't even have to tap. Look at that. Now, when you take a look at this chip over here, and you take a look at the one on top of it, aligned, aligned, aligned. I mean, does that look like someone whose hand does this? Soldered it? Not really. And again, at the end of the day, what you're looking for is technique. Technique is going to be more important than uh, your ability to have a steady hand. It's going to be that you're, you're going to come up with your own little compensations in order to get around not being the best at something. Uh, you don't have to be the best or perfect at doing something the exact way that you're told by an instructor in order to be able to do the job as well as the instructor or even someday pass up the instructor at his own game. But you're going to have to come up with your own way to do things. And you're going to come up with your own way to do things if you're willing to put in a little bit of effort. You want to put in a little bit of effort and put in some time to learn how to do shit that is kind of a, kind of a pain in the ass. Uh, so we're just going to take the, the edge bonding off of this. We're going to replace you. Remember, I want to replace the two pieces in the buck converter uh, in a t t with teamwork. You know, all at once. I don't want to just replace one without replacing the other in case it killed something. So it's going to replace you and you. This is from experience. This is not something that's written in a book like you must do this after this. This is, you know, what, when you spend three hours chasing the same fault because, and you learn what it was, you, it, it's one of those things where it sticks in your head and you'll never do it again. So that's why I'm doing this. Now, as Paul S. has told me, who, uh, who works here, one of the chief technicians, that in 80 to 90% of the time that you have corrosion on that MOSFET, your CPU is dead and there's no point in continuing. Yet, almost every time, both him and I still have this ridiculous, stupid, dumb, blind hope that this is going to be the time that it's different. This is going to be the time that everything is different than last time. Even though everything else is the same. It's a blind hope. And I can't explain why we have blind hope in such a way. But we do. What books or courses do you recommend for beginners? I recommend what's in the description of the YouTube videos, the Basic Electronics Guide. It's free. I wrote it specifically for beginners. It uh, looks like kindergarten. I haven't edited it in Twitch yet because Twitch has this weird panel formatting thing and I just, I honestly never put time into it uh, because Twitch is, yeah, so. But you, you can check that out. It's a really, really nice little document. And it's, it's really not, the, it's not there to teach you, you know, advanced theory. It's, it's, it's really there to get your confidence up that you can understand some absolute basics that are not, if you don't have any electronics knowledge or experience so that you could get started doing this type of troubleshooting. Uh, this tip that I'm using here kind of sucks, but all of my good tips have been taken, stolen, and bamboozled. Yeah, as you can see, this barely, can't even tend the tips here. How do you ever get to start with MacBook repairs? Uh, you get started by starting. Uh, how do you get the replacement parts? Ha ha! Dumpster diving, donor boards, so I get these donor boards off of AliExpress that I use. When you say parts, there's all different types of parts, and I don't like. You got to be specific. Like, if you say, "How do I get chips?" I can tell you donor boards, Mouser, Newark, uh, store.rossmangroup.com. If you mean screens, well, what model computer? Because some of them I can't get screens for. It even like, it, there's there's many ways to answer that question, uh, depending on how. Uh, how do you get started fixing shit? I mean you start like do, do you want to do it or not if you want to do it you'll you'll find a way you'll buy you know you could buy computers that are that are broken or you can find machines that have been recycled and you can make it your project to try and work on them on the weekend you know look through all these videos and try to figure stuff out there's tons of different i would recommend find you know again the problem is if you go to ebay you're going to find a lot of machines that other people have messed with that are completely unfixable like absolutely unfixable garbage. So they put it on eBay because it's unfixable garbage that has no hope. Because if it, if it had hope, they would have fixed it themselves. So it's really difficult to find a place to get that type of stuff. That, that's a challenge, that, that's a journey. 
So yeah, what I what I do is you, you you used to be able to go to AliExpress or Alibaba or just random suppliers and find these donor boards that are cut like this. You used to be able to get these for like 12 bucks and the cost has gone up tremendously. Uh, again, one of the only things that has not seen inflation in the past few years is cheese, which uh, the White House Twitter account is very happy about. Uh, but admittedly, a lot of it is that a lot of people have been watching these videos and getting into the craft, which kind of dr has driven the price up of many of these more scarce items. But you have these boards that have giant holes in them with the RAM and the SSD and the CPU taken off of them. But it has the rest of the components on it that are needed. So you have a nice little palette here of everything that goes on this particular computer. Now, I don't. the whole concept of troubleshooting by ordering chips one by one, that sucks. Uh, if you need to troubleshoot, if you want to figure, okay, is this chip the cause of my problem, and you have to wait a week for it to show up, you will, it will take you two years to fix a board at that rate. If you say, I'm going to buy every single chip and resistor that goes in this board, that's also insane. Having donor boards is a sensible way to be able to quickly troubleshoot a product that you're working on in an economically viable way. And then once you figure out that you're constantly using a particular uh, chip or device or a, a chipset or a resistor, then you could buy a bunch of them. But having a donor board makes things a lot easy. So watch this. See how the chip is going to get drawn into place via surface tension? Look at that. I'm just going to give it a quick tap. And now watch. When I tap it, see that? How it, how it kind of like squiddles back into place? That's, the, that's surface tension. Now I'm going to wait for the solder to dry. Once the solder is dry, what I'm going to do is I'm going to push down on the top of the chip to make sure that the chip is flat on the board because I want the chip to be flat on the board so everything connects on the sides perfectly. So now, as you can see, I, again, I have a shaky hand. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to push down. Now, even though I'm, my hand is still shaking, since I'm pushing down, I'm not going to be moving the chip to the left, right, uh, left, right, forwards, backwards. I'm just pushing down. I'm all, there's going to be solder that comes out the sides because that's, that's the excess solder from putting an uh, imperfect amount on the middle pad. I don't estimate exactly how much solder has to go on the middle pad. I just do that. And again, this is really helpful if you don't have great motor control or motor skills and you're not able to keep your hand steady and you really you get... I try to look for ways, I, instead of saying that you need to be perfect at, uh, at hand control in order to do this job, what I like to do here is I like to give people ways that you can be horrible at something, yet still excel and do work that looks, again, similar to what would have come out of the factory, if not better. And that, that's what we're aiming for here. And as you can see, this chip is on there. It is, it is perfectly placed. This, couldn't, this would not have been placed better by a pick-and-place machine. It is, if you had a little square around this chip, which most other PC boards do have, except for Apple, because Apple, you would see that that was placed perfectly in there. It's not, it's not, it's not uh, off-center. It's not crooked. It is perfect, and the joints over there are going to look nice as well. So this is on there very nicely. And what we are going to do here is now we're going to try and figure out the rest of what was going on with this device. So the notes said that the S5 rails were pulsing. So we're going to go over what S5 rails are, what these power rails are in general. I'm just going to wash a little bit of the flux off my hand because I got some flux on my hand and I wasn't wearing gloves because I was too lazy to put on gloves, which I regret at this point. And then we are going to get on to the power rail section and also how we can troubleshoot and figure out why S5 rails are pulsing if they are pulsing and try to get to the bottom of it. So let's, let's do that. So we're going to plug in our power supply, our little charger over here. I think you said a while ago along the lines of the best way of getting started with something is to start doing it. It's so obvious but also profound. It inspired me to work on my cars. Thanks. Lou. Yeah, I find that a lot of people and myself included, like, when I'm asking how do I start doing something, I'm really asking, like, I know, you know what to do. I mean, if you really, if you really want to figure something out, you know exactly what you have to do to get started. Just most people don't want to fucking do it because it's hard and it's miserable. And I understand. It is. Like, to just kind of bumble around for long periods of time trying to figure something out sucks. But that's really the, the best way to get started. You, you get started by starting. How do you fix something? Well, learn. Well, you know. Start fixing it. Well, I don't know how to. Well, why don't you know how? Because I don't know how to open it. Okay, well, now you know what you have to do. You have to figure out how to open it. Okay, but what about the rest? Well, what's the rest? I need to know how to take the board out of the case. Okay, well, now you know what you have to do. You have to figure out how to take the board out of the case. Okay, once I have the board out of the case, I don't know what to do with the board. Okay, well, now you've got to learn board level troubleshooting. What do, you need to know to, what do you need to learn to know that? You know, what you do is each time you tell yourself why you can't do something, what you're doing is you're creating a little curriculum for yourself in your brain as to what it is you need to do. Now, you may not want to do those things. You may not think you're capable of doing those things. But at the very least, at that point, you know what it is you need to do. 
Love your stuff and work and not repairs. Board a right to repair through you for a while. Thank you very much. I highly appreciate that. So now what we're going to do is we're going to try and figure out what is... Oh, look at that. It's taking 500 milliamps. Whoa. Okay. Okay, that's cool. So it doesn't look like we have pulsing anymore. Now it is down at 265 milliamps, which worries me because this machine typically does not take a static 263 milliamps. And remember what I said yesterday, when there's a static amperage draw that typically tends to point to a dead CPU, it would really suck if this was another dead fucking CPU. <laughs> yeah, I just am not, not, not in the mood for that at this point in time. But that definitely does not point to pulsing S5 rails. That points to... Oh, come on. Not another one. I want another dead CPU. Uh, oh, that is so sad. Oh, that is so sad. Isn't that, this is what it must feel like to be Paul, I swear. Being Paul and working at the store just means seeing dead CPU board after dead CPU board over and over and over again until you just want to cry. Like if, when you look at Paul's queue for the longest period of time, I don't know what it's like now because I haven't been checking in on it as much, but back in the day, it was just non-stop, non-stop. Just every other machine, dead CPU. And it really does get to you after a while because it makes you feel like... It's just, it's just pointless. It's painful. It's hurtful. Hey. It's hurtful. Who knows? Maybe, maybe this, this one will be different. Just one more try. Just one more try. Maybe this piece of New York real estate won't be overpriced. Maybe communism will work this time around. I have a very high in high level of human hopefulness that gets destroyed each time I work on one of these products. Bug number two on the battery. Nah, I don't. There's no bug on the battery. You're making it up. You guys are bullshitters. Okay. So the charging problem was fixed by the bug. The bug took a poop on the CPU MOSFET. Okay, let's see what we get here. So I'm just plugging it in. All I've plugged in is the charger in the screen. Nothing else. Because I want to see what happens. So 500 milliamps, 538 milliamps, 486 milliamps, 588, 551. So that's jumping around a little bit, which tells me that there's maybe some minor hope. And then the hope went away. Oh, 474. Come on, give me a question mark. I, wa I want a question mark folder. Give me a question mark folder. Give me a question mark folder, you... Ah, uh, yeah, this ain't gonna give me a question mark. Not even close. Yeah, 19 milliamps. You know what may do it? An ultrasonic cleaning. I'm curious if an ultrasonic cleaning would do it, but I don't think the cleaner is warm right now. Um... Okay, we'll do this one more. Because remember, that what was by the CPU MOSFET looked like liquid. So I'm going to hope and pray that this actually is ultrasonicable. The problem is that the ultrasonic cleaner, it takes like an hour to heat up, and it would be really, really boring to just sit here for an hour. So let's see if the ultrasonic is hot, and of course it is not. So yeah, that's going to take like an hour to heat up. I wish I had a, a water boiler that I could put in there. I need to get a water boiler for these particular occasions. <laughs> Plugged it in again. I adopted an eight a pair of eight-week-old kittens today. Any suggestions for their names? Hmm. Framework. I would name the kitty Framework. Okay, it's taking 470 milliamps, 490 milliamps, 483... 484, 45, 482, 485, 484, 485. I would name the kitty framework. And it looks like this is not not getting anywhere, unfortunately. This is kind of sad. Actually sad. Oh, wh whoa! Qu okay, question mark folder. So this is actually now turning on. So this is beautiful. So it looks like the reason that our S5 rails were pulsing is because our CPU MOSFET, 
had corrosion on it. And remember, if the CPU is dead, if the CPU is dead, then it's not going to tell every other rail on the computer to turn on. Now, the S5 rails should not be pulsing because the S5 rails are typically... I don't think they're turned on by the CPU in this one, but I'm just going to double check because I honestly have not been doing board repairs for a while at the store for a number of different reasons. I just kind of started doing them again because I can't for the life of me figure out how to get any of the people that work here to do them. Uh, but the, so let's see. If P, the S5 rails are going to be turned on by 3v3 S5 enable, where does that come from? So that is going to come from uh, here... Huh? R. This is no. Okay. P M E N P 3 V 3 S 5. Okay. So that's R7662. Pin 1. That is going to come from here, which I think is going to come from the PMIC. Here we go. So it's going to come from here. PMIC enable P 3 V 3 S 5. So that's a strange one. Because that comes from the PMIC. That is a strange one. Let's see. Does the PMIC communi in communication with the CPU and demanding that the CPU or the PCH do something before this happens? Yes, it is. PM Sleep S5L. PM Sleep S5L. Okay, where does PM Sleep S5L come from on this? PM Sleep S5L comes from the PCH section of the CPU. Well, there you go. So if your CPU is messed up, PM Sleep S5L is probably going to be pulsing. PM Sleep S5L pulsing because of CPU will may be what is causing the rest to not work, and that would explain it. So the charging issue appears to be it was not charging initially because it was scared of the bug that was in the device, and then this was going on because of the issue with the corrosion on the CPU MOSFET. If you want to know why it is that I replace both the CPU MOSFET as well as the buck converter controller chip in one piece, there are several videos in this channel where I go over uh, CPU V-Core buck converters. You can also watch the video that I did just two days ago. I went over this um, with, with w what happens. The TLDR is the chip that's corroded could wind up dying. When that dies, it can kill the chip controlling it. When the chip controlling it dies, even if I put a new MOSFET there, that could cause the MOSFET to stay on all the time, not only killing the CPU, but also killing that particular MOSFET. Because this board is doing funny things where sometimes things work and sometimes they don't, this is going to be going through the ultrasonic cleaner because there's going to there's probably this, like a sheen of some sort of liquid, even though I cleaned up the part with obvious corrosion, there could be some sort of stickiness under the CPU. Anytime I see some stickiness, like what I see over here, I am very, very wary. Even though this is not corrosion, what this means is there's probably some sort of sticky shit that got under the CPU. And this type of sticky stuff can cause capacitive crosstalk between solder balls so that one signal starts slowly leaking over to another and it can cause all sorts of weirdness that you really, it's almost impossible to, to diagnose and say exactly what's causing it. it but the, the ultrasonic cleaner, you know, I, I have a bunch of instructions over here, by the way, on repair.wiki. So if you check out repair.wiki, you'll see that I have a list of best practices for cleaning a motherboard using an ultrasonic cleaner since a lot of new repair shops tend to do this improperly or they use Windex or put the temperature too high. There's... Uh, really a best practice for cleaning MacBook motherboards over here that we go over to make sure that they work. What I would do in this case when you have that kind of sticky stuff is I may raise the temperature maybe 5 or 7 Celsius over what the normal is. I'll still keep it in there for the same amount of time, but I just may raise the temperature maybe up to 70 Celsius and keep it in there for the same amount of time just because I, I want all of that kind of sticky stuff out of there. And what helps with getting rid of the sticky stuff is up in the temperature a little bit in my experience. And after that, we would you know clean out the dust and everything inside the machine, test it out, make sure everything's working. And at that point, give it back to a happy customer. So that's it for... This is gross. Okay. You, you guys are right. You were right. I was wrong. Bugs. You are right. You are right. I, call, I, I apologize. I called you all liars. There was indeed another fucking bug over there. <sighs> oh, that's just gross, man. How many fucking bugs are in this computer? Time to take this thing off my desk. That's it for today, and as always, I hope you learned something. I'll see you all in the next video. Bye now.